Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another week of online services here at Osceola First United Methodist Church and Joiner First United Methodist Church. We are on the last week of Advent. The next time we meet, we'll be into Christmas. Um, I'm not sure yet uh, what I'm going to do for that Sunday. I might not do anything for that Sunday, Sunday at this time, um, but we'll see. Uh, there will be a Christmas Eve service up, though, so I'm just letting you know. Um, and it will appear on Christmas Eve. Uh, it'll be the same type of service we've done in the last couple of years. I could probably just repost it, but I'm going to re I'm going to just re-record it and <laughs> everything. Um, but you're welcome to join us uh, for that service. It'll be probably around 5 p.m. that it's posted up here on face Facebook on wherever you're watching it and everything. Uh, all right. Uh, today we're going to be in John chapter 3. We'll be reading verse 1 to 21. John chapter 3, verse 1 to verse 21. And as always, before we do that, let us pause at this time and go to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you now in this time of prayer. We thank you so much for this day that you've given us. Thank you for this journey through Advent that we've been able to take together, reminding us of your hope, your love, your peace, your joy. Uh, not in that specific order, because we don't do it in that specific order. Uh, or we haven't preached it that specific order, but we still thank you so much for that, Lord. Lord, in the, on this day, we just ask that you just be with those that are in need. Uh, might you provide them comfort and help, whatever it is that they're going in, through, whatever it is they're going through. We also thank you for those that help those in need at any time, at, at all times, Lord. Uh, Lord, help us be be the ones that go out into the world, be doing your doing the good that you've called us to do, being your hands and your feet. Help us remember that you're with us at all times and help us remember that we might be waiting at times for your love, your hope, your joy, your peace, uh, but other other aspects of that, other parts of that have already with us as well. And we thank you so much for that, Lord. Lord, be with us today. Be with us as we go into Christmas, as we celebrate the Christ child, as we understand uh, what it means for this world, for all that you've done for this world. And we thank you again, Lord. Thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you for who you are. And thank you for being with us today. In your son's holy, precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, like I said, we are in John chapter 3. And we'll be reading verse 1 to 21. John chapter 3, verse 1 to 21. And the word says this. <clears throat> now there was a Pharisee a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone, be so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, and said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify of what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you not how then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his Son, and his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, 
so that it may be seen plainly that th that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed. All right. You know, I have a lot of respect for Nicodemus. I really do. Um, he's not talked about just a whole bunch. Uh, you know, this is his big moment in this. You know, I think we, I know we hear about him other times in the Bible. Uh, and that's just because, you know, of where he's, uh, where, <laughs> what, what role he plays in some of this, some of the other things that happen. But I have a, I actually have a, a pretty decent respect for him. Why is that? Well, it's because of who he is. Now, it's not saying I respect everything about him, but or before him, before this, but it is who he is. He's a religious leader. We we find that out right here. Uh, it says it kind of multiple times in a way. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus. So it's a head Pharisee. Remember, we've talked about you know what it means to be a Pharisee and who is a Pharisee in that world. And sometimes, or and there are Pharisee, Pharisaical leaders. Uh, he was a member of the Jewish, Jew, Jewish ruling council. Then Jesus goes on to say, uh, you are Israel's teacher and do you not understand these things? So, you know, we know that he's a respected man. He's a religious leader uh, and he has quite a bit of power. He is that guy. I've always imagined him as this guy. He's that guy who has read his book backwards and forwards and can throw scripture after scripture at you. You know that type of person. For every every instance of every little action that takes place in the day, little event that takes place in the day, place in the day someone has like a scripture just to hit you with. Not necessarily in a bad way, but you know they have a scripture for everything. Um, even as someone who has a master's degree, in the Bible, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I don't remember. I don't memorize scripture like that. I remember I memorize stories, but scripture like word for word, nah, I don't do that. <laughs> I just never have, and I probably never will. Um, and we can chalk that up to ADHD, but we're not here to talk about that right now. But Nicodemus is that guy who reads his book backwards and forwards and can throw scripture after scripture at you. When we get caught up in scripture, though, we can get it. We can get to a point where we think we have it all figured out. And that is actually a problem. When we, again, when we get caught, so caught up in scripture, we can get to a point where we have it all figured out. But remember, and the reason why I say it's a problem is because when we read scripture over and over, you know, what do we always say? Or what have we always heard? We hear things like, oh, I learned something new every single time. But if we, if we get to a point where we're thinking, oh, I've learned it all. There's no other way of looking at this. Then we get to this point you know, where we're stuck and thus there is no more need to wonder, but wondering and asking questions, it's all a part of the process. It's all a part of understanding God. It's all a part of understanding Christ of growing in our relationship with God and with Christ. So even if he wasn't supposed to, which I don't think he was. And the reason why I don't think he was is, you know, because of how the story takes place or where the story takes place and everything. But even if he wasn't supposed to, Nicodemus decided to find Jesus and ask him questions, which is a good for him motive. Good for him, not motive, but good for him move because he gets answers. He's had, able to have a one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. And he also finds, this is not really what the story talks about, but he also finds that Jesus is receptive of him as he is of everyone else. And you got to understand why that's important. He is a Pharisee. He's an opponent of Jesus, especially this particular type of type of Pharisee. I don't know if that's the right word. Uh, but this particular group, the religious leaders, Jesus was taught willing to talk to them just as much as he's willing to talk to anyone else. So good for him that he seeks Jesus out and good for him that he's willing to have this conversation with Jesus. But I will say, I will say he had to be bothered prior to meeting Jesus. I'm sure he was. Um, I don't know if prior to meeting Jesus, if he was a little bit on board I don't know where he was coming from. You know, we can always speculate a good speculation. And I say good speculation because it's just a narrative story that tries to expand upon the actual story is the chosen series. The chosen series is really good. They have a, honestly, one of their, that episode, which is in the first season where he talks to Nicodemus the first time. I love it. It's one of my favorite things, but we're not, again, we're not talking about that. We're talking about this right here, but he had to be bothered prior to meeting Jesus. First off, he comes at night, meaning, again, the meeting was hidden pretty much on purpose. Uh, there's other reasons why it's at, or there's other reasons to look at it at night, but we're 
you know, again, for the third time, we're not really worried about that for this particular for this particular sermon. But he comes at night, probably meaning that the meeting, his meeting Jesus was done, hidden in a way on purpose. And he also admits something. He admits that the Pharisees know that Jesus was sent by God. Now, that does not mean he know, they know that he is the Messiah. Um, they're not there yet. They're not on board with that yet. Now, maybe after this particular meeting, um, you know, Nicodemus has a different result or different um, idea. I do believe Nicodemus is one of the ones that walks out when Jesus is put on trial um, and he does not participate in any of that. Uh, so, you know, there is that. But that does not mean, you know, being sent by God does not mean that they believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Uh, but it does mean that they looked at Jesus as some kind of prophet, which is something. It's a, it's a something that I kind of want to go back and explore at some point in the future. And, you know, because, you know, they know he's sent by God and yet they're opponents of Jesus. And that says a lot. But he's also bothered by their te by the teachings. Now, I don't think he's bothered in a way of like, I don't know if he's particularly bothered in a way of like, this is wrong. This is totally wrong or anything like that. He is bothered because he is being forced through the lessons of Jesus to take a different look at the teachings of God from the Torah to the prophets and, and the wisdom it's all of those things. Um, he's having to re look at the scriptures, he's had to re look at the teachings and what he's taught because now Jesus has come and turned it all upside down in a way. And that has to be very, very frustrating, very, very frustrating. And this is the part where I compare this using a sports analogy. Um, you know me, I like to go to the Raceback football games. When I go to the Raceback football games, I have a particular seat that I go and sit in uh, because I have the tickets to do so. When I'm at this football games, I'm sitting in one of the end zones. So the reason why I'm telling you this is not to brag or anything like that. I'm telling you this because I see the game from one angle. If there is a person who is a who sits on the 50-yard line every single game, uh, every single home game that is, they see the game from a different angle than I see the game from. And guess what? If we switch, we're watching the game from new points of view. The game will look different and at some point or at some times maybe even feel different. And now add a person who watches the who watches on television and again you have three different points of view. You have the 50 yard line point of view, the end zone point of view, and the game and the game pretty much from above and on television point of view. And they are, again, they are, they are three different points of view. We're not going to argue who has the right one and who has the wrong, wrong one for this, but it's three different points of view. And you see the game differently, and sometimes you feel the game differently. Nicodemus is that guy that's been sitting in the end zone. I was not going to compare what Jesus did, or <laughs> Jesus to me at all. But Nicodemus is that guy that's been sitting in the end zone watching the game, from one focus, from one point of view, and never shifting, never changing at all. Jesus comes in and shows him what it's like to watch the game from the 50-yard line. Jesus comes in and shows him what it's like to watch the game from the television. He shows him all the different angles of watching the game, and it's new perspectives, and he's got to wrestle with that. He's got to come to grips with it, and he's got to realize, I'm not going to say he's been looking at it all wrong, but he's got to realize that there are different angles and Jesus wants him to see it from a different point of view that God wants him to see it from. So there's that. Now, because of how Nicodemus looks at the scripture prior to this, he takes a very literal approach and is unfortunately unable to grasp the concepts that will, of what Jesus has been teaching prior to this and even in this text today. But Jesus is telling him, or what Jesus is telling him anyways, is that it's all about the spirit. And ultimately, ultimately, it's about relationship with God. Nicodemus, once you accept what God is doing, you are forever changed. That's what Jesus is teaching him. It's expanded upon, obviously, but that's what Jesus is teaching him in this text. If you accept what God is doing, then you'll be forever changed. Then you'll be born again. And once you accept that, once you're born again, once you understand that, my friend, is where the kingdom of God is. 
hearing all this leads him to ask a very, very important question. And I do believe it's a very important question. How can this be? How can this be? Seriously, how can this be? How can this be? Do we ever ask that question? Do we ever um, put that upon ourselves as well? I mean, it's not wrong. It's not wrong to ask questions. You got to understand, when he comes to Jesus and asks questions, the only reason why, the only thing negative, and I don't even think it's negative at all, is, you know, Jesus is basically poking him and saying, Nicodemus, why, if you would study it from different points of view, if you would look at it from different angles, you would understand this because you are a teacher of the law or the teacher of the scriptures. And that's, but you don't understand it because you only look at it from one point of view, but he doesn't get mad at him for asking any questions. He doesn't get mad at him for not understanding. He is, you know, it's a gentle rebuke in a way for, you know, being a studier, being someone with knowledge and not using all of the avenues of knowledge he could be using. So how can this be? Jesus elaborates, this is all possible. This is the obvious answer. Jesus elaborates, this is all possible because of God. This is all possible because of God. Now, what did God do? Kind of a rehash of last week a little bit. What did God do? When God created existence, how did God create existence or what avenue did God create existence through? I'm giving you time to answer yourselves. Not going to take very long. But when God created existence, he did so through love. He did so through love. When God breathed life into us, he did so through love. These are things that happened. God created us through the act of love or, or because of love. Now, we could probably take that into a way that's super confusing, but we're not going to do that right here. But all of this, when God created it all, he did so through love. Now, and again, like I said last week, it's not just the, the, the stars, the galaxies, the trees, the rocks. It's us as well. And the creation is created through love. When we pushed ourselves away, and we did, we pushed ourselves away from God in an act of defiance. Why? Because we were afraid, because we thought we knew better, because we thought we could make a better path. I mean, it's really name it, claim it type of thing there. But when we pushed ourselves away from God, it was an act of defiance. And there is a deserved punishment there. We, we acknowledge that. every Pretty much everyone agrees, pretty much, <laughs> pretty much everyone agrees that that act of defiance is deserving of punishment. But instead of deserved punishment, God ordered a way back. And there's beauty in that. And that, that way back wasn't a punishment for us. That way back wasn't um, designed to break or hurt us. No. The way back to God was done through an act of love. We weren't, we weren't supposed to be condemned or punished. Not at all. And why is that? Because when you love someone, hear this, when you love someone, you don't destroy them. You don't. You don't destroy them. God does not want us to destroy the ones that we love. God wants us to lift them up. If they have hurt us, we can restore them. We can restore them. So that's why God didn't condemn us. That's why God didn't punish us because God loved us. And again, when you love someone, you don't destroy them. You restore them. Now, think about this. Think about this. As we've already kind of talked about a little bit, the Advent is about waiting. It's about waiting. And we've said last week, too, uh, that you know some of these Gospels are written during exile or during occupation. Both are true. So imagine you're in the midst of exile. You're in the midst of occupation. How often do you mind? How often do you think they ask themselves, "Is this a punishment from God to get us back on track?" You don't even have to look at the Gospels if you want to. There are times in the Old Testament that that question is asked in different in various books. Are we being punished 
for our transgressions? Are we, you know, is God striking against us? Is this a punishment from God to get us back on track? Truth be told, most of the punishments that come from Israel are kind of by their own design. But it's not punishment. God's making it clear, especially here in John and through the words of Jesus, it's not an act of punishment that is going to restore us. It's an act of love. It is an act of love. An act of love will restore us. And if you're in exile and you're, or you're in occupation and you're wondering, what's going to happen? How are we ever going to be restored? How many lashings do we need to take? It's not about that. God's not going to restore you through that. God is going to restore you through love. And so we wait on it. We wait on that love. We wait on that restoration. We advent for it. It's an act of love that will restore us. And that act of love will give to us hope, peace, and joy. Or it will lead us into those avenues so that we know, so that we can have peace where we are right now, so that we can have joy knowing that we are loved. And this same thing goes to those that are in their own personal exiles or occupations with sin, with hurt of various types, going through trials of all sorts, the same thing goes for them as well. It is an advent of waiting. It's an advent of love. It's an advent of hope. It's an advent of peace. It's an advent of joy. God's not punishing you to restore you. God is lifting or reaching out his arm and giving you all of these things so that you will be restored. But it's not through punishment. It's through love that we are restored. So we ask ourselves, why is this happening? Am I being punished? Are they being punished by God? Again, no. God is looking to restore us because of love. Christ doesn't come to condemn, but to save and restore. Now, you could say, but it says right here, um, <clears throat> for God to love the world, he not whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's Son and only Son. But those people that don't believe, they are, they're condemned. They are condemned. Again, like I was talking about with, uh, with uh, the Israelites, the ancient Israelites, the ones before the New Testament was written, we only find ourselves condemned when we reject the act of love. That condemnation is done by us. In case in point, if you're sick, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to take your medicine. If you don't, you won't get better. That's the truth. If you're given away to restoration that's through love and you reject it, then you're, you can't be restored. That's what Jesus is saying. Accept it. If you accept the love, you will find restoration. If you accept the love, you'll find hope. You'll find joy. You'll find peace. You'll have all of these things. You'll be able to get through. You have to accept it, though. But if you reject it, you're condemning yourself. John is telling the people here in the story, God loves you. For God so loved the world. God loves you. Christ is telling Nicodemus, you're loved. Nicodemus, I know you're an opponent. I know your friends are opponents. I know that you want to stop me. I know that you even want to kill me. Maybe not Nicodemus, but he knows that those that are in the same position as him want these things. You, you fear me. You all of these things me that aren't good. But Dick and Demas, I want you to know as well. You're loved. You are love. How can this be? That's why it can be. Because of, because of love. Because of God's love. It's why this can be. It's why this is. You are loved. All of you. The Advent is about love heading towards us at an unbreaking space, pace, not space. The love of God through Jesus the Christ. The question is, will you celebrate that love? Will you continue to wait for that love? Will you accept 
that love. In Christ, all of us in Christ, let's accept that love. Let's do it. Let's accept that love. Because that love is for all humanity. Every single last one of us. No one is exempt from it. No one is unworthy of it. No one is undeserving of it. It is for every single human being. Every single one of us. No matter color, race, uh, beliefs, lifestyles. It's all for us. Because God so loved the world. And everything in it. It's a love for all humanity. Let's accept that love and let's extend that love to others who don't know it yet. In Christ, amen. Amen. Good people. I wish you a Merry Christmas. Go from this place with love, peace, joy, and hope on your hearts. And go, go give those gifts to others so that they might know that they are loved. And know this, that we are going together and Christ leads the way. In his name, we go now. Amen.